I'm stuck on an earring. Okay. Well, good morning. Um, welcome to Calvary Moravian Church. If you are watching from home, enjoy your warmth. Um, we do apologize. We apparently had our boiler kicked off last evening, and um, although we reset it when we came in, of course, it takes a long time in this heat, so in this cold. Um, I think the, the good news is uh, we've gone up. I think it's a balmy 62, if I'm reading that right, um, in here, uh, up from 45. So it's, it'll, be, it'll be great. You can stick around and help us undecorate, and it will be wonderful. So um, feel free to uh, warm your hands as much as you need to, and if you need to get up occasionally and stand by a heater, we'll completely understand. But um, welcome to Calvary, that may the, the warmth of God's love and God's light be within you and your hearts and your spirits and your minds as we come into this season after Epiphany. Um, and for us, we are kind of melding Epiphany back into this service as we, um, of course, were virtual last week due to the freezing rain. And um, we will be, we've moved our Holy Communion to this service, which would have been scheduled for last week. So at the end of this service, we'll be celebrating Holy Communion um, in celebration of Epiphany. Uh, just a couple announcements before we begin. If you did not get a chance yet to get your uh, watchword for 2022, you're welcome to pick up your watchword, a, a wonderful tradition that we have within the Moravian Church of having a, a word of scripture to watch over us uh, throughout 2022. Uh, after church today, we will be undecorating, so if you're able to stay just for a few moments, like I said, it should be nice and warm by then, um, we'd, be, we'd love to have you help us undecorate. And um, within your bulletin, you'll see uh, two things that are, are um, happening right now within um, both the Lehigh Conference of Churches, where we're a member church. Um, one is that throughout the month of January, both our joyful noise collections and in the back we have a basket, um, we are collecting items for the weather alert food boxes that are being shared with um, either the soup kitchen clients or anyone in the homeless camps as bad weather approaches. Um, the workers at the conference are really relying on these to get food out to uh, people who need that and might not be able to come in uh, to the daily soup kitchens. And also, uh, just next week, uh, right after Martin Luther King Day on Tuesday, January 18th, begins a week of prayer for Christian unity. And this is a long existing week that's um, been dedicated by the World Council of Churches. And this um, year, instead of one gathering, there'll be an email blast sent each day of the week of Christian unity, um, inviting you to join in just a brief devotional and also to learn a little bit more about the ministry of um, the Conference of Churches. So you can see where to sign up for that if you're interested. It's really a really great way to kind of just engage daily um, in a devotional. And, um, and then on January 25th, there'll be a gathering on a Zoom um, worship service uh, in the evening. So you can read more about that in your bulletin. Um, again, I thank you for your patience with our heat and um, may the Spirit of God be with us as we, we worship together this morning.
Our church year opens our call to worship as we move from the celebration of Epiphany. Um, we talked last week of the visit of the wise men, the Magi, as they brought gifts um, perhaps for adoration, but gifts also perhaps of caring and compassion for this newborn. And now we read in our scripture and our call to worship today um, of the baby Jesus grown and um, in the, before he begins his first acts of ministry as he is baptized by John. So from Luke uh, chapter 3, verse 15, as the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one is coming more powerful than I. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floors and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And it goes on as we hear of the baptism of Jesus. So when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And maybe in those verses that we attribute um, to these, these beginning readings in our new year of Jesus um, finding the spirit descending upon him and God declaring to him, you are my beloved. We hear echoes uh, of our watchword that we've selected uh, two Sundays ago, and I wanted to share again in case you weren't able to, to worship with us, our watchword for Calvary, for our congregation for 2022. From the 51st Psalm, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth would declare your praise. Again, um, I think we hear these remnants and reflections, uh, echoes of God giving us this sense of spirit, of saying maybe to each of us, you are my beloved, and then asking us how we're gonna declare God's praise. How will we open our mouths? Um, and again, those connections. So as I thought of, of our watchword for 2022, um, a, a beloved hymn uh, alerted in my mind, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. So uh, the Charles Wesley hymn, uh, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, will sing verses one, two, and five of 548. Uh, please stand. Let's turn to our prayer of commitment. Again, as we asked where God might open our lips and our mouths. As put it in your bulletin, we pray these words. Holy God, may we hear your voice in the stillness of night, in the clatter of day. You call us and we respond. Here I am, may we follow you and may we love as you love. 
Holy One, through trials and turbulence, make us steady. Your hands holding strong the fragile and weak. May we love as you love. Gracious God, may the fruits of our lives be food for the hungry. May we love as you love. God of justice, we move the barriers of our lives that keep us from one another. Barriers that we construct based on skin color, religion, or gender. May we hear and follow graciously. May we love as you love. Loving God, take this day our fears, worries, and distractions, turn them into grace and mercy. And following the example of Martin Luther King Jr. and all your saints, may we love as you love. May we say with one voice the affirmation of our faith as Dr. King showed us. We refuse to believe that we are unable to influence the events around us. We refuse to believe that we are bound by racism, war, and injustice. We believe that those around us are our brothers and sisters deserving of dignity and wholeness. We believe we can overcome oppression and violence without resorting to it. We remember Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can. Amen. You may be seated. Now we'll take just a moment to pause and ask um, for prayers. We know that we are um, tomorrow celebrating the Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And again, as we remember his legacy, um, and those words we just shared, that hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. We remember the gift of his love and the ways that it's manifest um, in continuing actions of service and of uh, humanity to each other. So um, are there prayers that, that you'd like to lift up for um, strangers, for friends, uh, for yourself, prayers of thanksgiving or, or prayers of concern? Melissa? Yeah. So we're happy to hear about Olivia being uh, feeling better and uh, being out of the hospital, right, and uh, being recovering at home. So uh, prayers continue for her. Thank you. Any others? Um, prayers for um, Joanne Lester. I did learn um, from Ed that she is I, either in the hospital or being released today. Um, they She was in with uh, high fever and um, some infection um, issues. They thought they got it under control, but um, as of yesterday, they were hoping to send her home today. So um, keep Joanne and Ed in your prayers. Um, also, I think just it goes without saying, um, as I'm trying to do some visits of, of those with in uh, retirement communities, and we know in nursing homes, um, being both precautions are being now raised again. So prayers for those who are um, in retirement homes and perhaps being a little bit more isolated uh, at this point. Um, I did hear that uh, from Jean, uh, asked for prayers for Chuck, who um, is fine, but they're probably gonna be shutting down um, his, his wing at Moravian uh, Village. So um, just to keep those in your prayers and all of our members who are in retirement homes and nursing homes today. Any other prayers? All right. Um, well, let us pause for a moment of prayer together. Gracious Lord, Today, as we remember Dr. King, we ask that we remember his witness of allowing love, love that is, is deep in justice and uh, 
work for equality, but love that continues to find ways to seek community, to seek dialogue, and to find ways not to resort to violence. Allow his message and this love to resound within our hearts and our communities, uh, as we know that we live again in trying times, times when we are yet within this pandemic, times when decisions must be made and um, prayers for those in those, in those positions. Times when, if it's within our personal lives or in our community, we find sometimes that we feel lost or uncertain or unsure of where your voice is. God, remind us that each and every one of us is your beloved, that we are created, as the Apostle Paul says, with gifts, gifts that we can share for your common good. Remind us and allow us to recognize those gifts wherever they are, to not doubt that we are your beloved and to go forth into this world sharing those gifts, most importantly, the gift you've given us to love. We pray now together as we remember our Redeemer and the one who loved us so deeply to share his life with us. As he prayed, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, we remain grateful for your gifts um, of financial support for our congregation and recognizing those gifts. I'd ask that Sue would bring up our offering plate um, again, as we collect either in the beginning or the end of service, but remember at this moment and give thanks to God for the gifts God's given to us. So today, before I, I welcome Sophie up, I just wanted to say a word about our focus um, that we're going to start today within our scripture reading and hear about uh, over the next six weeks. And that'll take us right up until um, Transfiguration Sunday and right before the beginning of the Lenten season. Um, the lectionary that we follow each year um, devotes a section to most, mostly Apostle Paul's uh, writings, and those are, of course, right behind the Gospels, uh, right after the Gospels. And in, for six weeks, we have a focus around um, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And so just a word about this letter before we, we hear um, a little bit more as we're going to start with chapter 12 and then we're just going to go right through from chapter 12 into 13 and then kind of finishing up with a big section on, on chapter 15. 
So Paul is writing to the Corinthians and um, his letters, there's two of them that we have recorded in our Gospels or in our uh, New Testament, his letters are largely thought to be a response to a previous letter um, that is written to him or perhaps to some rumors or things that he's been hearing and, and mostly signs of division or discord that he's been hearing um, coming from the city of Corinth. So scholars think that Paul had visited uh, the city of Corinth, which is south of Greece, uh, south of Athens in Greece, um, around 50 AD. So if, if that orients you, a very, very early uh, visit, um, an early letter that we have, um, so just some maybe 17 years after Jesus' death. So you have Paul visiting Corinth around 50 AD. Corinth was a significant city in Greece, and so even though we may not have heard of it today, it's, it's a really significant city uh, in that era in Greece. It was known as a commercial hub. It was a hub of, of um, lots of different trading posts. It was also a religious hub. There was a diverse number of different religious expressions happening there. Um, but it was also known uh, as a place that lacked morals, uh, a place that, that had a lot of people not really caring for the poor among them, living in discord. And so Paul is introducing, by, by introducing the gospel of Jesus, he's introducing a radical way um, that the followers of Christ can live out their love for all people or can see their gifts being exhibited in all people. Um, so today we're gonna hear a piece of that radical vision, and we'll hear more and more of that as Paul um, highlights some of the most important theological um, treatises that we might have as a Christian faith within these chapters. So, um, Sophie, thank you for being able to read today, and she's going to be reading to us from the beginning, uh, uh, from chapter 12, uh, from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can ever say Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are very varieties of gifts, but not but the same in spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but the same God who activates them all for everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. The, to one is given through the spirit of utterness and wisdom, and to another, the utterness of knowledge, according to the same spirit, to another, faith by the same spirit, to another, the gifts of healing by one spirit, to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, the discernment of spirits, to another, various kinds of tongue, to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these activities, all these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually just as the spirit chooses. Thank you, Sophie. Um, we're gonna sing together a little bit more about uh, what Paul has written um, from Hymn number 620, We Are All One in Mission. We're just going to sing verses 1 and 4, which will capture um, the idea of these gifts being given, many different, but all of one of the same spirit. So verses 1 and 4 of hymn 620. Please stand.
Men, you may be seated. So as I said, I wanted to begin our worship time today with a reading from the gospel that um, we have assigned for this Sunday um, as we move again from the celebration of Epiphany last Sunday into now the beginnings of Jesus's ministry um, that were highlighted by his baptism. But it wasn't so much the act of the baptism that caught my attention this week as we uh, move again into Paul's letter as our focus, but it was the fact, and every year I, I think this, and then I rethink this as I remember it every year, but that in all of the Gospels, following Jesus' baptism, there's a central theme. There's God speaking, um, sometimes sending forth the spirit of a dove, um, and saying out loud in some way, or voicing, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Um, and it's Jesus, not any of the thousands of the crowds that are gathering to be baptized by John. It's Jesus that has that moment of God's declaration um, there. Now hold that for a second as we look into uh, what Sophie read to us from um, Paul's letter to, first letter to the Corinthians. And as I explained earlier, we'll be focusing on this letter for six weeks, um, relating about how Paul is responding to a lot of the issues in Corinth and the, the questions that the Corinthians are asking about divisions that are happening in, um, in their early church. So um, before we get to that though, there's, there's an interesting, if you wanna read more about Paul's journeys, um, and of course the early church's journeys, that's all found within the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is not written by Paul. It's, scholars think, was actually written as a kind of part two of, of the Gospel of Luke. But the book of Acts records um, Paul's journeys just in a brief moment to Corinth in chapter 18. And we hear in chapter 18 in, in the book of Acts a little bit about how um, Paul is going out to the synagogues. So we know there's, there's Jewish people in Corinth. Um, but Paul is also talking to the Gentiles. And as we hear in, we heard about pagans, uh, his reference to the Gentiles, that Paul's talking to a diverse number of people. Um, and he's having some disagreements and he's getting kicked out of places and others aren't really happy with what he's doing. And yet we have this central line and I put it within the bulletin because I thought it was significant that God speaks to him in a vision in, in Acts 18 and says, do not be afraid but speak and do not be silent for I am with you. And so that's kind of the foundation of Paul's uh, journey into Corinth of God saying, don't be afraid. Things aren't always gonna be easy, but speak, speak. Um, again, I hear remnants of our, our watchword that we um, selected for our church um, in that. So Paul is speaking and he's responding in, in chapter 11, um, even to the disagreements that are happening about the different gifts that people have within the early community. But he says, you know, it's not that we're all gonna have one gift. He uh, talks about the diversity of gifts that, that you might have and he lists them. And here's what he lists as, as gifts. He says, the speaking of wisdom, the sharing of knowledge, healing, miracle working, discernment of spirit, prophecy, interpreting different tongues. I know that Paul's point is that we've given a whole bunch of different gifts and none of them are better or worse than each other, than each. Um, they are meant, he says later on, to benefit the whole body of Christ. And so there's a diversity of gifts, but one spirit, you're supposed to benefit the common good. But I know all that, but when I heard these gifts and read these again, Maybe your reaction was like my reaction of kind of, wow, like where do I fit among all of those gifts? The utterance of knowledge, the, the giving of wisdom, healing, prophecy. Okay, so where's, where's my location in these gifts that Paul says? Um, or maybe even earlier as you heard God's response to Jesus saying, this is my beloved, my son. You think, wow. Um, did I have a voice ever come to me and say, you know, go out and speak and do this and, and wonder where is, is my gift? Where am I being um, pushed? So 
Paul's letter is asking us to think about that, to think about how we're, we're called by God, um, how maybe what gifts we have that are either within us and undiscovered or gifts that we are already sharing. But sometimes I think when we hear these words, they seem so lofty and high achieving and, and hard for us to imagine where we fit in. Um, I don't know how many people I've, who has seen the movie Encanto? I, I don't, all right, <laughs> maybe. So this is why I'm not gonna talk about Encanto, but if you happen to watch Encanto, which is on Disney Plus, um, and I know maybe Disney Plus doesn't always cater to a, an, uh, a more mature audience. Is that how I say it? Uh, okay. <laughs> but the new Disney movie Encanto speaks exactly to Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And so if you do have a chance to, to watch it and you ask questions about how um, each of the characters in this new movie are given gifts, um, and yet there was one character who is grappling for her gift. And without spoiling it, um, it's a beautiful movie that talks a lot about each sharing your gift for the common good um, and not hoarding your gift, not um, using it for your own gain, and not being worried or self-doubting when you don't know if where you can discover your own gift. So I'm not gonna talk about that, although I just did. What I am going to talk about is a book that I recently picked up um, by Dr. Brene, Brene uh, Brown. She's a, a research professor and author. She's been on Oprah. She has been kind of been rising in popularity among, um, among everyday folks. Um, and so I recently picked up this book for another purpose. Um, I was going to look into it for, for some Lenten reasons, but the title caught my eye as I was rereading Paul's uh, talk about gifts. And the title of her book is The Gifts of Imperfection. And the subtitle is Let Go of Who You're Supposed to Be and Embrace Who You Are. Let go of who you're supposed to be and embrace who you are. So I think I lost my bookmarker. Here we go. Okay. So I was beginning to read it a little bit um, this week, and, and within it, uh, Dr. Brown relates about how many of us have been in those places of maybe reading Paul's spiritual gifts and having those moments of self-doubt and saying, so where do I fit in? Um, she, she writes about how many of us believe we think those gifts should be such lofty ideals, um, things like courage or compassion, or maybe as Paul would say in, in first century Greece, um, things like speaking in tongues or miracle working or uttering wisdom. And she asked in her book that instead of looking to such expectations of what we are not, she asked if we start instead from a place of what she calls wholeheartedness, a place of worthiness. Um, so she says, can we ask that question, answer that question, no matter what gets done or how much is left undone, I am enough. And she gave this great example, I thought, of, of talking about what she says is an imperfect gift, or we might call it an imperfect gift, um, but a story that she talks about with an ordinary act of courage. And so I just wanted to share this with you. She, she has a son who um, was in preschool at the time, and she said she attended her son Charlie's preschool um, holiday gathering. She says, you know the scene, it's 25 kids that are all up front singing with about 50 plus parents and grandparents and siblings all holding at least 39 video cameras. Um, Parents are holding up the cameras to make sure that the kids know that they're there, in part, she says, and waving wildly to the children on stage. She says, in addition to all the commotion in the audience, there was one three-year-old girl who was new to the class, crying her way, her whole way through the entire performance because she couldn't see her mom. As it turns out, her mom was actually stuck in traffic and missed the performance. By the time her mother arrived, I was kneeling at the classroom door telling my son, Charlie, goodbye. From my vantage point, I watched the girl's mother burst through the doors, immediately start scanning the room to find her daughter. Just as I was ready to stand up and point her to the back um, where her daughter was, another mother walked by us, looked straight at this stressed mom, shook her head, and rolled her eyes. I took a deep breath. 
I wanted to reason with that part of me that wanted to chase down this better than you, eye rolling mom and kick her, well, I won't read that part. Uh, you can get the picture. Just then, two more moms walked up to this now tearful mother and smiled. One of the mothers put her hand on top of the woman's shoulder and said, we've all been there. I missed the last one. I wasn't just late, I just completely forgot. <laughs> I watched as the woman's face softened and she wiped away a tear. The second woman looked at her and said, my son was the only one who wasn't wearing pajamas on PJ day. He still tells me it was the most rotten day ever. It'll be okay, we're all in the same boat. By the time the mother made it to the back of the room where the teacher was still comforting her daughter, she looked calm. Something I'm sure came in handy as her daughter lunged for her from about six feet away. The moms who stopped and shared their stories of imperfection and vulnerability were practicing courage. They took the time to stop and say, here's my story, you're not alone. They didn't have to stop. They could have easily joined that perfect parent parade and marched right by her. As these stories illustrate, courage has a ripple effect. Every time we choose courage, we make everyone around us a little better and the world a little braver. That gift and sharing of an imperfect gift, that I been, I've been there story. Um, just one example that maybe can equate us to finding the gifts that we have, taking time to share, stop and talk to a stranger, a place that I am worthy and I have something to offer this world. It's interesting, in one of the last speeches of his life, um, the Dr. Martin Luther King spoke to a group of students at Barrett Junior High School in Philadelphia. And in a really short speech that was entitled, What is Your Life's Blueprint? He said something similar. He said, number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief, belief in your own dignity, your worth, your somebodiedness. Don't let anyone tell you that you're nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth and your life has ultimate value. And he goes on and he's referenced this before, but in this beautiful, and if you ever hear this speech, is this beautiful cadence of how he says this. He says, if it's your lot that falls to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted, picture, painted pictures. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. If you can't be a pine at the top of the hill, be a shrub in the valley, but be the best little shrub on the side of the hill. So your gifts, if they, you might call them gifts of imperfection, but realizing how perfect they can be in that case that Dr. Brown shared about how they can change a life through an ordinary act of courage, your gifts of whatever they are, we see, and Paul says this in so many words, are only useful when they're shared, right? Like those moms, they could have stayed silent, but their gifts would have been hidden away and not useful at all. Our gifts cannot build up, as Paul might say, the common good if they are left within us. So finally, <clears throat> We do, and we have these gifts, the last significant piece of, I think, of Paul's writings is to realize that the gifts are given to us from the Spirit. And he goes on and on and reminds the Corinthians of that, that they're not us to hold and brag up, but they're given to us by the Spirit. And so in this kind of beautiful, secular motion, they are being, to be given back to the community because they're not ours to begin with. They're be, to be given back, um, like the rainwater is given back but to give them back to the community to build up the body of Christ. So we, we are here today and we asked ourselves uh, what gifts we have and maybe when we ask this in church, we think only within the four walls and we hear Paul's references again, gifts of preaching or teaching, um, gifts of, of doing service, but things that are within the church. And that's great, and we need those gifts to be developed. And heaven knows we need more of those gifts within this church. But at the same time, Paul is reminding us that those gifts are gifts to be used in our secular world as well. And there's no um, walls that are constructed in Paul's mind between the walls of worshiping Christ on a Sunday 
and worshiping Christ every day of your life. Um, he writes that the Spirit tells us wherever we are to say that Jesus is Lord. If it's 1045 on a Sunday morning, we say Jesus is Lord. If it's using our gifts as moms did to hold up someone who is tearfully running late, it's saying Jesus is Lord. It's reminding our world around us that Jesus has given such love for us that we, in our gifts, wherever they are, give those that love to others. So let us, um, as we're going to hear more next week about um, those different gifts and being a member of the body of Christ, find ways and think through um, where we can build up this body of Christ. Amen. So as we prepare ourselves for the sacrament of Holy Communion, um, we're very glad to just be able to pause for a moment of mu musical meditation and very, very grateful for Bob Kale, um, who is here to share some special music uh, with us as we still are within this epiphany season and um, enjoy this rendition of We Three Kings. Thanks. Amen. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. We here are at the, the table that the Lord has set for us, uh, welcoming us with the gifts of love 
mercy, and the Spirit of God that will always abide within our hearts. And so as we partake of this holy meal, we welcome you. Um, again, has, has been our practice during um, this little bit of adjusted period to um, come forward, as it says, during some special music after my prayer. Um, you may pick up bread and a cup at that time. And if you choose and would prefer, we do have the self-sealed cups with the wafer and the juice within. Um, so all are welcome. The table is open. Um, and again, we welcome you. Again, turning to our bulletin um, as we share in the sacrament. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we share the right wave of fellowship. Let us pray. Oh Lord Jesus, thank you for preparing this table that you welcome us to. Thank you for the gifts of your life, the gifts of your love given so deeply for each and every one of us. Thank you for choosing us and calling us your beloved. As we partake today, may the gifts of bread and of cup these ordinary elements remind us that each of us in our ordinary gifts have extraordinary ways to share your love. We pray this all in your name. Amen.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this whenever you eat of it in remembrance of me. By your divine presence, by the holy sacraments, by all the merits of your life, sufferings, death, and resurrection, bless and comfort us, gracious Lord and God. Amen. In the same way, after supper, our Lord Jesus Christ took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ, the Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant to us your peace. Amen. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And let's stand as we sing our closing hymn and share the right wave of fellowship again. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.